So I first met uh, this next presenter uh, when she attended one of the R workshops I was teaching. And recently I was very excited to be like, hey, let's have you speak at this conference because you do really cool work in a uh, very public facing field. So I'm very excited to have her here. Um, and she wants everyone to know that she spent a summer in North Dakota on an internship. And she was there to write a story about a small town that had a population of 30 people. And she says, while visiting the town for interviews, she increased the Asian represent representation in that town from zero to 3%. So please, everyone, welcome to the stage, Jasmine. Thank you, Jared. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm excited. Um, my name's Jasmine Han. I'm a data reporter with Bloomberg Industry Group. Um, we are part of Bloomberg. Um, okay, additional fun fact. While I was in North Dakota, I did grow a liking of American food because I'm a, originally from China. I have an Asian taste bud. Um, but anyway, um, I, uh, I moved to the U.S. in 2014 for journalism school, and now I'm based in Maryland. In my free time, I like cooking, plant, plants, um, climbing indoors, and doodling. So on to today's topic, uh, data journalists are toolbox. So a lot of people I meet in real life, you know, new people I meet, ask me what, I, what do I do. I tell them I'm a data journalist. They give me a very confused look um, because there's a notion, uh, at least in the past, that um, journalists are good at words, but not at math or anything in adjacent. But there's actually a bigger and bigger uh, community of people who like doing both, telling stories and doing math or coding, programming. So yeah, today I'm here to show you that Yes, data journalism is a thing, it's cool. And then how we data journalists use R. So, all right, so what is data journalism and why should I care? I don't know how you all keep track of the COVID pandemic, but I keep coming back to this New York Times landing page. It's pretty much all the information I need. There are a lot of uh, independent efforts tracking COVID out there, but I find theirs to be the most intuitive and most comprehensive. And they also, um, the data quality is very trustworthy because uh, they have a team dedicated to the scraping, the cleaning, and the reporting, etc. Um, so based on the data uh, they keep track of, they did a series of stories on the impact of the COVID pandemic, including this one that shows um, racial or ethnical uh, inequality uh, of COVID contraction rates, and including this one, which is a interactive map that allows readers to just look at how full the hospital ICUs are in your own neighborhood. So this series won uh, the 2021 Pulitzer Prize in Public Service. And the jury said that they filled a data vacuum that helped uh, the general public to be better prepared and protect protected. Um, so yeah, data journalism helps fill a gap of information. They turn data into information that can be used by the general public. It's a public service. And in addition, data journalism allows us to tell stories that go beyond words and readers are put directly into the story and they can tell stories of their own. And uh, I'm using a quote by Aaron Williams. He's a former Washington Post uh, data reporter who did this beautiful piece uh, that used maps to illustrate the trends in uh, America's diversity, but also segregation. And at the end of the story, he allows readers uh, to zoom in on your own neighborhood, uh, an area of your own interest, and tell your own story by gaining like insights that's relevant to your own experience. So, yeah, and last but not the least, uh, data journalism exposes systematic problems in ways that journalists just can't otherwise. For example, 
this investigation by the Atlanta Journal Constitution um, exposed a broken system that allows doctors discipline for sexually abusing their patients to continue to practice. Um, so the reporter scraped uh, doctor disciplinary action documents from state bar websites around the country, all of them. They collected, it must have been over 100,000 documents. I need to double check the numbers, but it was a huge body of documents and they developed a regression model to filter down these documents based on keywords uh, down to about 10% uh, that were potentially uh, sexual abuse offense. And then the reporters vetted uh, these 10% documents and drove the rest of the reporting from there. So if it weren't for this, do uh, this data, it wouldn't have been possible to prove that this is a systematic problem ha happening nationally on a large scale. And if it weren't for the, the model, it would have been impossible for humans to go through all of these arguments. And sometimes when the data is really big, it gets journalists around the globe to collaborate and reveal the rich and powerful sturdy secrets. So this investigation by uh, International uh, Consortium of Investigative Journalists, along with about 100 media partners, uh, they used um, a leak, uh, leaked documents, about 11.5 million documents, that exposed the secret financial dealings uh, by some of the most powerful people around the world. So the ICIJ uh, built a Neo4j graph database um, that, uh, that allowed reporters to uncover basically relationships between key stakeholders, key entities, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, as a result of the story, um, re uh, it revealed companies that helped uh, Syria's deadly air war, or uh, a network of people close to Vladimir Putin that secretly moved billions of dollars through banks and offshore companies, and then a secret company of former uh, prime minister of Iceland, and he had to resign over the citizens' rage and protests. So basically, as a result of this investigation, governments fell, authorities launched uh, tax probes, criminal investigations, uh, so it is very impactful. So hopefully I have so far convinced you that data journalism is very cool and very impactful. And so what does it have to do with R? We're in a R conference, so we're going to talk about R. Here's a life cycle uh, of data analysis project and uh, data journalism project, project shares very much a parallel between these steps. So the point of showing this uh, chart is to say that a lot of these steps we can do in R. So we start from an idea, we need to understand the data, and then prepare the data, sometimes script the data, clean the data, and then we do exploratory analysis, maybe in this analysis do some visualization, and then we validate the data, uh, what we're finding, sometimes using R or by talking to sources or subject matter experts. And then moving on to the production phase, we produce visualizations and then a story of words. So for example, I want to highlight a project I did about a few years ago um, on tariffs. So I learned so much about what R can do uh, from this project. In 2018, former President Donald Trump imposed tariffs on imported goods uh, of steel, of aluminum, or Chinese goods. So that meant that U.S. companies trying to import these goods uh, will, will be faced with uh, increased costs. So they're, they're being challenged. Um, but the administration does allow companies to sort of submit a request saying, can we be exempted? You know, what we want to import is not manufactured in the US, you know, for reasons like that. 
so they can submit this request form. Um, in addition, uh, they allow third parties to object to submitted requests. So some companies might say, you're a liar. We actually manufacture this in the US. You can buy from us, so you shouldn't be exempted, just for an example. Uh, and then the uh, administration or you know the Commerce Department then make decisions uh, for these requests and they issue this decision in uh, a decision memo, PDF documents. So they actually post these documents on uh, individual dockets for these tariffs on regulations.gov. So we were able to scrape these documents, uh, process them, analyze the data in it, in them, and then uh, did a series of stories. For example, this one that looks at uh, how corporate America is sort of on the losing end in a bit to ease the tariffs and how uh, US manufacturers that are seeking relief are just left in limbo in the backlogs and red tape. And we found some of the top automakers are imploring to get relief from Chinese imports, including, so Tesla requested uh, relief from uh, a product they call that serves as a car's brain. So that's very essential to uh, their product. And then also how pet supply industry also took a big blow. So cute. Um, here's how we did the scraping. We use uh, these libraries and here is our repo a screenshot. We have several uh, scraping, record, uh, scraping scripts, but to just boil down to, uh, to one line of code, what's most important is this line. So we sort of piece together a uh, URL for the API call. Then we use the get function to retrieve that document. And then we use XML parse and then XML to list function to parse it. And then we then we are able to sort of pick you know, what we need. And then you might notice that we use sys.sleep and try catch a lot because these prevent us from being seen as a bot and then get blocked from the website server. And then try catch allows the code to keep running when we're hit by an error. And in processing, we uh, relied heavily on SpringR and PDF tools. Here's an example of a request form. You can see it's very heavily, um, heavily styled, a lot of merge cells, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it's not the clean data frames that um, we're used to seeing. But deep down, it's basically a great system, right? You have row number, cell number, et cetera, et cetera. So to extract the information, we sort of need to use these uh, section, uh, you know, the section numbers and then some of the keywords to sort of serve as the road sign almost to tell us, you know, where the information we need is at in this grid system. So we used uh, which and grep to find these row signs and then uh, you know, get back that index, that row and cell, and then retrieve from there. And this is an example of a decision memo. And there's some pattern here. They always uh, reveal the decision at the end of the uh, at the end of a letter with big X. So I approve denying this exclusion request. Um, so what we are looking for here is that big X. So what we did with these PDFs, we first of all parse them with the PDF text function and turn it into uh, like a vector of sentences. Like each row is one, uh, one like each row serves as one uh, row. And then we find this uh, big X, right? Space, X, space, using regular expressions so we get to that line we want. So that's very, uh, that's vastly simplifying the process, but I think I've included the key information here. 
Uh, and then after the scraping and processing, right, we sort of dump the data tables into a PostgreSQL database, uh, which we then are able to access via the RODBC library. Um, and for the analysis, we built a Shinyr dashboard that uh, allows us to do uh, preliminary or exploratory analysis, keep updating it based on the most uh, updated data. And we ha relied heavily on a uh, high charter library to produce interactive uh, visualizations. So uh, for example, we looked at steel exemptions, how many of them got, uh, how many requests got a decision, how many didn't, how long they had to wait for a decision. So these charts informed the story on the, the US manufacturers facing uh, backlog in red tape. Uh, and here uh, is a map that shows which congressional districts these requesting companies are from. So we can infer, okay, which uh, legislators might be uh, interested in, in this issue. And then we also included some charts on top companies, which are the top companies submitting requests. And uh, we actually also included a searchable table that allows us to search company names. Uh, so that's a quickly, that's a quick tool for us to find, you know, the automakers and pet industry companies. And it was very useful for our, uh, for those stories. And uh, down to the graphics. So we are, uh, we have a very small graphics team uh, in our newsroom. So a lot of times my colleague, uh, my, my colleague Aaron and I, we produce sort of a bare bone version uh, and then hand it off to graphics for, uh, for, for styling. And we use these uh, libraries a lot. So for the maps, I believe I use TMAP for this one and Tigris is also often used so we can, because graphics artists, it's really hard for them to sort of hand draw all these vectors uh, as maps, but we can easily do it in R and then hand it off to them. And, um, and for charts, what I really like about ggplot2, it allows you a lot of customization. So I, we were actually um, able to style it exactly as uh, how our style guide um, would require, like including you know, the font, sizes, colors for each section. So it's really neat. And I can pretty much uh, get the charts 90% of the way uh, before I, I can hand it off to uh, our graphics colleagues. So it's a huge boost in productivity. Um, there's so much more I wanted to talk about but because of the time limit, um, but uh, feel free to uh, reach out, keep in touch, and yeah, thank you.